You are listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. Today, we're in Chamrous. Hello, I'm Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. Daniel Freib. Hello, Taps. And this is a bit of a different podcast today. This is an As Live Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. We, the stage hasn't finished yet. We are on our way to the summit of Chamrous, first day in the Alps. And we're going to sort of bring you dispatches as the stage unfolds and then come back at the finish. So they're about to start the, the final climb. Um, already a difficult day for um, Vincenzo Nibali with uh, his uh, teammate Michele Scarponi being dropped on the first climb and Jakob Fulsang crashing quite heavily on the descent and you see like, another of these kind of inexplicable crashes he came down very hard indeed but was up quite quickly um, washing his wounds with his bead on and carrying on, not sure he'll get back for the climb but you know that, those are two very very strong uh, teammates in the mountains especially aren't they Lionel? They are probably the two strongest teammates in the mountains um, I'm not sure, I haven't really seen yet where uh, Scarponi's been riding on the f- climbs today we would have seen I would have suspected he'd be second last man or last man and Fool Sang would be the um, would be the other one that would do the, the final pause for Nibali so it's going to be interesting to see how it pans out um, Daniel made the point on Twitter about the climb of Shamrus being uh, quite sparsely populated compared to Alpe d'Huez which is not that far away um, but I thought as we drove up <laughs> It's a long way, isn't it? 18 kilometres. And it does feel noticeably longer um, than Alpe d'Huez. And it is steep in places. Yes, it is. Now, we're in the car now, in Team Jaguar. That was the, the door closing there. Um, and we're about to drive up. Uh, I'm not sure if I should... I don't know what the rules are about podcasting and driving. So perhaps hand over to, to Daniel. Well, I'm already alarmed because we're going to be coming up against the publicity caravan, yeah, which is just coming through the finish. Hasn't put his oh, belt on. <laughs> the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar, with Richard Moore, Lionel Burney, and Daniel Freib. So, Daniel, how do you think the climb will play out? We've seen Francais Dijeux coming towards the front. They've obviously got Thibaut Pino highly placed overall um, how do you see it playing out um, well, I see Pino is one of the favourites today it's a climb that he likes it's quite steady long um, and something I think which may be to greatly to his advantage, advantage over the next week or so is the absence of Freeman Contador not just in the way that they'll alter the race but um, I spoke to him a few weeks ago about you know, his future ambitions and where he saw himself in relation to those guys. And he sort of admitted that he was quite intimidated by them and he didn't really feel that he could ever attain the same level as them and he felt that they dealt better with stress, etc. And he was almost in awe of them. And with those two now gone, I really feel that he's lost any kind of inferiority complex that he had. And, you know, you can almost see his chest is puffed out um, and he seems a different animal, really. So I expect him to go well today. This is the publicity caravan. Yeah, the publicity caravan boys and girls are demob happy there. They've they've probably spent five hours out on their various vehicles, waving at the public, throwing things out, and they've crossed the finish line. And um, probably time for them to hit the bar. I would have thought. That's a dangerous assumption, Lionel. <laughs> uh, just on the subject of the French again, they keep once again today going big on the uh, you know the sort of French Renaissance. Um, it was Pino and Roman Bardet on the front uh, uh, of front page of Le Keep today, and a lot of not a huge crowd on the climb, but a lot of French flags. I think we spotted, and and you know perhaps there is a sort of resurgence of interest in the Tour in France. Is that your impression as well, Daniel? No, it wasn't actually. Um, <laughs> no, I, 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 I mentioned this to Sam Dancy, my travelling companion, that um, I didn't really feel that it hit it had had an impact just yet. what about the french having um several riders up there overall does that embolden them in a way because there there isn't just one rider shouldering the hopes of a nation yeah and i think you know it, i talked about a complex there and this is something that they've had for many many years it's a sort of hangover from the post festina era when they didn't feel they could compete and um the french themselves constantly talking about their riders being um, de-complexed literally so 
um, having that kind of sense of inferiority just gradually kind of eroded and now they really do feel as though they're on an even footing and they can compete with anyone as regards i mean the individuals themselves perot is is not so that's the second ag to our la mondial rider 37 year old former mountain biker he's not the most aggressive rider and he will probably try to hang on as long as possible barde on the other hand is young and sort of quite impetuous at times very aggressive and I think we could well see him attack today. But he will probably be the one French rider who is, who's willing to risk everything over the next few days. Well, we'd better park up, Richard, because um, we've, we've just seen the shuttle bus going up to the finish line there. So we're now trekking up the hill. We've abandoned the Jaguar and we're trekking up the hill uh, to the finish. Uh, still quite a bit of the stage to go. Uh, I think they're about to start the climb. We were out at the start this morning in St Etienne, um, speaking to various riders. Uh, I spoke to Michal Kiakowski, the Polish rider we've been speaking about a lot on the podcast. Run over while uh, I had a, a, a chat with uh, Michal, very nice chap. I should explain, I asked him at one point about his, his academy, which he established over the winter. He's a very young rider, but... He established an academy for young riders modelled on a sports school that he attended himself as a, as a teenager. And this uh, academy is for kids from age 9 to uh, 19. Uh, and they, uh, he's now got 120 uh, kids in, in the academy. It's a full-time sort of sports school model with coaches employed. Uh, and it's a residential as well for kids who've come from outside his hometown of Torn. So anyway, here is Michal Kwiatkowski. Almost two weeks into the tour now, you're, you're well placed overall. You've also been aggressive on some stages. What's the ambition for you here, to, to finish high overall or to perhaps try and win a stage? Uh, actually, no, not at all. Not, not no. one of them. You know, I think this tour is my second Tour de France and the most important thing is exploring myself and I don't know how I'm going to end up. And... Uh, for the moment, uh, everything going well, you know, we won two stages even without calf and uh, that's amazing and uh, I was trying, I was always close but, uh, you know, a bit of luck and uh, could be better but uh, yeah, I never give up and I will try to stay with the best riders in the upcoming stages. So primarily it's a, it's a learning experience, is it for you? Yeah, of course, you know, it's a thing, uh, you really have to know your limits on the, on the Grand Tour, you know, I... I still know that I, I could prepare better for the tour, you know. But you know, I'm always um, my ambitions are high for every other race. So uh, yeah, of course, Tour de France is the biggest race uh, of the year, and uh, I want to show myself, uh, especially here. But uh, you know, it's uh, it's not like that. That Tour de France and nothing else. So uh, how how is your form? Because you you've been winning since February. Right at the start of the season, you've been in great formal year. Strada Bianchi was a, a terrific race for you as well. Um, how, how do you feel your form is now? Have you managed to maintain that since that, that sort of flying start you had? I think uh, it doesn't feel like like I was in the, in the first part of the season. You know, I had uh, not such a big you know break between uh, between uh, Romandy and Dauphiné, and uh, I lose my confidence actually. On, on Dauphiné, I was not sure what's going on, and uh, I was back in form for national championship, and then I was not actually sure about my form for, for the tour. But the uh, first week show, I'm um, on the good way, but maybe not for the high climbs. But still, I I I could do something here, so that's important, you know. And uh, yeah, we will see. What was it like the other day riding behind Tony Martin for so long? What, what's he like as a teammate? Yeah, he's he's incredible. He's uh, you know what he gives to the team is just uh, you cannot really describe, you know, because uh, he's a he's a great champion, but he he bring a lot to the team, you know. He always because of him there is a great team spirit, and uh, even I was really motivated for for the taking the yellow on that day and uh, winning the stage just just because of Tony Martin because he he pulled the whole day and and uh, even after the after the. <laughs> The stage when he was alone and uh, taking the, the win in the uh, stage before. Mm. And are you running your national tour, tour Poland this year after the tour? 
and my national. The Tour of Poland, are you riding the Tour of Poland this year? Yeah, I would like to because the second stage starting from my town and uh, that's a good opportunity to show, uh, you know, the supporters from Poland and uh, and actually the first four stages are flat, then we have two hilly stages and then time trial, so it would be nice to be, be there, but, you know, I'm just focused now mm. on the Tour and uh, I want to see how I end up the Tour. And quickly, how's the academy going back in Torn? It's, it's going good, you know. I think we have for the moment 120 riders, wow. and, and and that's amazing. And uh, yeah, we're working on that. And uh, and uh, you know, I think I will I will meet them after the tour. And uh, uh, they they went to actually training camp during the the Tour de France in uh, somewhere in Poland, and uh, they were watching me on the, on the tour. So I hope I was great inspiration for them and. Uh, I was trying to and do my what, best. What, what's the age range there? What ages are they? From actually from eight till to junior, so until nineteen years old, you know. But finally, Michal, we've been talking about you a lot on our podcast, and a few people in Poland have been pulling us up for our pronunciation. Can you pronounce your your full name for us, please? Yeah, Michal Michal Kwiatkowski. And, and one more time, Michal Kwiatkowski. You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. So that was Mihai Kiertowski. I spoke to Simon Clark of Orica Green Edge. He was in the long break on whatever day it is today, Thursday. the previous day, <laughs> Thursday, that's right. Um, he was away with Sebastian Langevelt of the Garmin Sharp team for a while. Um, then he was with Cyril Gautier of Europe Car. Um, and I asked him about the art of getting into breakaways on these kind of hilly stages in the Tour and also the mountain stages in the Tour where... Uh, Simon Clark is sort of expected to get up the road and uh, if, if he gets lucky he might be still in a position to contest a finish on a day like today. It's actually his birthday today, I think his 28th birthday. Um, I actually didn't find that out until after I'd spoken to him which is why I didn't wish him happy birthday in this little chat. Simon, can you talk us through your day yesterday out on the escape? How did it go? Uh, pretty well, I suppose you could say. Uh one of my main jobs here, uh, the reason I'm selected for the Tour de France is to be in breakaways and, and try and win from the breakaway. So uh, that being my job, uh, I had the best go at trying to succeed yesterday and uh, unfortunately we just came up short. But yeah, uh, I think it was a, a good opportunity and a good, a good stage to really put on the line and, and try and pull it off. Can you talk us through how hard it is to actually get in that breakaway? Because people turn on the television to watch the last hour or the last couple of hours and they see the break established. But for you guys, it's a lot harder than just riding up the road, isn't it? Yeah, no, it definitely is. And often we can attack for you know 50 plus kilometres trying to get in the breakaway. Yesterday, you could say I probably fluked it and that I only did one attack and and got straight into it on the first go. So. Uh, that doesn't happen very often, and, and I thought, well, you know, if, if that's it, maybe things ever uh, things could be going my way that day, and and uh, it nearly did. But uh, yeah, it, it can be a very challenging task. Circling a day and, and wanting to get in the brakes, one thing, but actually getting in it is another. So uh, yeah, I was happy to be able to, you know, it was a team plan to get in the break, and, and it's always a bit of a stressful. Uh, uh, exercise getting in there because if you don't then uh, it, it doesn't reflect so well on the team plan so uh, it was good to be present Are there sometimes recriminations if you're planning to get in the break and then it doesn't work out? Oh, I think we saw that from Europe Car I, I'm, uh, yesterday I'm sure they wanted to be in the breakaway and unfortunately they missed it and uh, if you do miss the break you end up chasing the break and, and we saw that happen yesterday and they tried their uh, their move in, in the final yesterday and uh, neither of them work so you can only try and, and hope for the best. So you guys that get in the breaks you're almost like a subcategory in the tour itself when you get up there up the road do you look around are there are there certain guys you look at and you think oh, I'm glad he's with us because you know it's going to give you um, more opportunity to gain more time I mean it struck me that Langeveld you couldn't really have asked for a better guy to be with in that kind of move towards the end. Oh definitely you look uh, especially with with Ra both Gregory Rast and, and Langeveld I was really happy that those guys are in there and uh, you can never choose who you get in the break with uh, so to just uh, happen to be in the break with those two guys it, it could have been, couldn't have been a better situation and that really gave me a lot of confidence uh, with our 
uh, breakaway potential to, to succeed because of the experience we had there. And I think with Gregory and Sebastian you know, working together and we've had a little bit of a plan and, and how we were going to ride, how hard we were going to ride in particular parts of the day. And, and uh, I think by sticking to that, we came pretty close to pulling it off. Last couple then. Um, when you're in that break, do you have much conversation with the other guys or is it an unspoken thing? Because we see on the graphics sometimes the percentage of who's doing most of the work. Yeah. Uh, do you kind of have an agreement I'll work on the climb somebody else maybe work on the flat somebody else take it perhaps on the descent just to share the workload up to a certain point and then it's everyone's um, takes their own chance uh, not necessarily uh, in terms of workload but we do uh, discuss uh, the pace that we're going to go in particular parts of the stage so uh, initially you, you, you push a bit harder to get an in initial time and then, uh, and then you back off, and uh, for a period there, you're just at the mercy of, of how far the, the, the peloton is willing to let you go. And then you, you wait and, and pick a, uh, a part in the race where you're just going to go for it to, to the line. So not so much about particular riders doing certain uh, uh, extra efforts and others not, but more about everyone riding evenly, at an agreed pace and, and varying that pace depending on the part of the stage. And the last one then, um, looking at the road book, it's a pretty daunting run from here to Paris. I mean, every day, uh, I know the stage to Nîmes is flat, so that doesn't offer much for, for the for the breakaway riders like yourself, but every day is daunting. So, I mean, do you just pick a particular day that you're going to target again or will you just keep going every day or how, how are you looking at the last uh, nine or ten days? Oh, look, there's so many factors that come into it, you know. Uh, I think that if uh, you just need to take it on a day-by-day basis, uh, you would never have, uh, a couple of days ago, you would never have picked Giant to maybe ride on a day like yesterday, but after uh, John Degenkolb had such a good uh, result in second the day before they had a lot of confidence in him to perform again yesterday and, and they were willing to commit and I was pretty aware that that was going to happen but with the heat and you know there's so many different factors you just need to make an assessment of, of the days up and coming days and, and pick the, the day that you think is the best uh, chance for the breakaway to stay. So that was Simon Clark of Oica Green Edge. Daniel, you spoke to a couple of people this morning. Very quick fire, this isn't it? We're going from one to another. Oh yeah, yeah. Recapping on the it's morning, and then great. we'll. You got anything to add? Apart from that, Daniel, before we go into your clips. Well, um, happy birthday, Simon Clark, if you're listening. Um, He's bound to be. Who else? Who, who did I speak to? I had quite a long conversation with Johnny Schleck. Unfortunately, it was in French, so no good for the podcast. That's Andy and Frank's yeah, father, um, who was talking to me about how impossible. It is for Andy and Frank now, the scrutiny they face with the, from the tabloid press in Luxembourg, how he told them years ago that they needed to move to Monaco, but they, wouldn't, they, wouldn't, they didn't want to give up their fishing um, in Luxembourg. Actually, on the subject of fishing, um, we mentioned Thibaut Pino. I know I mention him every day, um, multiple times, but um, we're coming into the Alps, and he's one of the few riders who's never done any altitude training in this Tour de France, or certainly contenders, for the general classification in sort of France. One reason is he loves his fishing too much. He doesn't want to go away and not be able to fish for more than 10 days or two weeks at a time. Fish don't like altitude either, do they? <laughs> is, there, is there nowhere with a lake uh, with fresh water fishing? So, he, like the Schlecks, he also has his own pond. Right. So, well, if we're just walking past Greg Lamont's car, he's a big fisherman as well. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, on to much more serious matters. Obviously, yesterday there was a, a tragic... Um, event the the plane crash in Ukraine and there is only one Ukrainian rider in the field that is Andrei Grivko the Astana rider and I spoke to him this morning about um, what had happened yesterday and you know how much of a distraction that was for him. You, you spoke to your family and checked they're okay. And... Yeah, for sure it is a big tragedy for uh, I think for the whole world because in this ship it was uh, people from Europe, from uh, Australia, from. A lot of country. And, uh, I think it's a big message for uh, this whole uh, of country like Europe. For uh, and the really this aggressive uh, Russian politic uh, and uh, try to do something really serious and not it's just not not more war uh, from uh, Russia with Ukraine. It's now it's also a problem. Uh, 
for the international people. Has it been on your mind a lot in the last couple of months when you've been racing the situation back home? My situation is just uh, like it was before. We have last uh, months. Uh, it was always. Uh, it was normally. It was work because uh, every day uh, died some person. Died some uh, some some people in Ukraine from a terrorist and uh, this is a big problem but uh, alone for uh, Ukraine is very difficult because uh, Russia has big power and uh, also politically uh, we need the help from Europe and uh, America you know, from all uh, from and specifically from where you're from your region and um, how is the situation there uh, there is uh, mm, uh, like it more more easy because uh, I was from Ukraine uh, from Crimea and Crimea more easy because uh, people just live alone and uh, Ukrainian military just go away from there because there is was a lot of Russians military and don't 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 do the war like in uh, Donetsk uh, but uh, uh, people don't uh, uh, but uh, all uh, all Crimea wish turn back and uh, with Ukraine but. People not wish dying, not wish war, and uh, just waiting for maybe of uh, very big pressure uh, for uh, do some politically for uh, turn back with Ukraine. So we're we're nearing the top of uh, the climb here at Shamrus. We're about to head up some steps to the team buses, which are parked just beyond the finish line. There's the familiar mountain smells at the Tour de France of burning clutch. <laughs> yeah. This looks like a steep hike, Richard. We've got to yomp up some right, see if we can, right, grassy see if we can do hillside. This and, not, and not a sound out of breath, shall we? <laughs> Daniel's bounding ahead. Uh, not sure what he's trying to prove. He's a little bit younger than us, but... Who's that breathing heavily? Is that you or me, Lionel? Sounds like you. <laughs> yeah. Come on. We can Come on. <laughs> oh, where's my inhaler? <laughs> oh, for a moment, that was alarming. Very alarming. Right, we've reached the top of the steep hill. We're in the compound where the team buses Gregor are. Gregor Brown. There is Gregor Brown. All the journalists making their way Snooping to the finish area. Gilles. Gilles Simon from L'Equipe. What a fortuitous this meeting, Bonjour. Gilles, because we are recording for our podcast here. Le Keep have been getting very excited this week about the, the French riders. How do you, or, yeah. do you do you feel this is a big weekend a for them? A little bit too much. A little bit too much excited. Gilles is the head of cycling at Le Keep. But you clearly feel that, that this is a big opportunity for them with some of the favourites out, out of the field. It's a big opportunity, but they're still young. And um, it's a little bit early for, for them. Maybe one of the both young riders, uh, Bardet or Pinot, can do something important. Maybe, maybe a third or fourth place. But they will have to... To win the race maybe a bit too soon, is it? Yes, obviously too soon. Yeah. Obviously too soon. How big would it be in France? We compare it often to Wimbledon and British tennis players for years didn't get mm. very far in Wimbledon. How big would it be in France for one of these riders to finish on the podium it would be great because we are, we are waiting for 29 years for a French winner but it can also be a danger for them they are very young Perrault can can finish on the podium and it will be safe for him mm. but for Pinot and Bardet maybe it can be dangerous Pinot can win the Tour I'm but, convinced but of that yet. but not yet uh, maybe in 3, 4, 5, 6 years mm. 2 years ago he finished at the tenth place, and he has paid it mm. at the at a high price uh, a year later. Mm. I don't want him to pay again next year if he climbs on the podium. Yeah, so today. better s- gradual progression. Maybe the best for him will be um, a fourth or fifth place yeah. with a white jersey. Great, yeah. thank you, Gilles. I'll let you get to the finish. Thank you very much. We better catch up with Daniel, Richard. Um, he's he's gone heading head. off. He's yeah. watching the big screen that's on the side of the Garmin Sharp bus. Very uh, considerate of them. They wheel the awning out. They do. Roll no, the awning no, out no, for us so we can Garmin stand in the shade. Sharp, always very, always a very uh, accessible, open, friendly team, aren't they? And there it is on the side. Paul's been popped. 
Port's out of the back. Port, Port Richard Port is off, off He's the, out the back. Ready, right at the start of the game. There, there goes Pino attacking. Goodness, well, we weren't Daniel, really expecting the moment, that. The moment of Pino attacking, I thought you'd sound a bit more excited than that. <laughs> I think he's ecstatic and say so he's just trying to he's trying to be cool. He's trying to be cool. We should probably mention just a, the, what Grivko said there, um, the Ukrainian rider. Um, he talked quite interestingly. I know his English wasn't particularly great in that clip, but um, he speaks much better Italian, I must say. Um, he spoke about how, as far as he's concerned, everyone in Crimea, which is where he's from, um, feels very much Ukrainian and can't wait for Russia to sort of be be forced out but which I was you know kind of quite surprised by but um, there's so much uncertainty in that country at the moment um, where, where is he ba- do you know where he's based Crimea, at, Crimea. But, oh he's uh, based at, I think season. in Italy uh, but presumably family and, and friends are all there it, it must be a, a really terrible thing to be to be living through at the moment and it, perhaps we don't I mean this is not a, a really a subject for a, a cycling podcast but it's you know, what, new ground for the cycling new podcast ground, what happened it? yesterday I think brought into sharp focus just how dire and how awful the situation is there and you know did did, did you feel that he um this is something he's been living with for week, weeks and months now yeah that's what he said you know yesterday was really just more of the same it was just an escalation and um yesterday it was obviously predominantly tourists that were killed um or all tourists that were killed and um he was sort of more more well, dismayed by what's been happening over the last six months um you know, uh, the this, this sort of ongoing civil war that's, that's been happening there. So we're, we're watching it now outside the Garmin Sharp bus, about seven and a half kilometres of the climb to go, and uh, a group of four has uh, been established at the front. Uh, Vincenzo Nibali, Alessandro Valverde, who started the attack, Thibaut Pino, who's been doing an awful lot of work, and Lawrence Ten Dam, who's sort of just hanging on to that group, and behind TJ Van Garderen and Roman Bardet seem to be leading the chase but they've fallen a minute behind and looking well, at that front group I mean we well let's not forget that uh, Raphael Maika and Leopold Koenig are up ahead oh, yeah, let, the, but this is the main that. group of favourites let's not forget that apologies I forgot about those two they're, 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 they're up ahead um, but that group behind could be the well certainly looks like it might be the podium at the end of today it, it could be the, the podium in Paris Nibali Valverde and Pino is that premature? Well, a little bit premature, I would say. Um, Pino's very inexperienced. Um, Valverde, well, we've seen Richie Port already have a bad day. That's always been his Achilles heel in major tours. Valverde has the same problem to a certain extent, less so in the Vuelta in previous years, but certainly in the Tour de France. Um, but they're certainly putting a, a good amount of time between themselves and this group that we're just watching now, headed by Roman Barde with um, Jürgen Vandenbroek on his wheel. Barde looks good, though. He, he looks like he's still got a lot of riding in him. I- but you wonder with these efforts he's making now, what you know, why he wasn't able to follow the, the initial move. I mean, the guys, the guys in front look like they've got another gear, don't they? They look like they're, well, they, they almost look like they're literally using different gears, and um, they're much more powerful. Here, here goes Nibali. Oh, yeah. An attack by Nibali. This is going to test Pino because he was riding at the front. I know, Daniel, you made the point when we were just talking before we started recording again that riding on the front in the mountains doesn't sap the energy quite as much as riding on the front the difference between sitting in the wheels is not as significant mm. going uphill but it's still a little factor and as we're seeing now Nibali's pulled out quite a gap there and by showing his hand there Pino Valverde can quite legitimately look at him and say well you were setting the pace a minute ago you close that gap yeah and I think the drafting factor um, probably is quite significant on a climb like this okay um, it is fairly shaded but also the road is also very wide so um, you know there will be some there will be some exposure to the wind on there won't there yeah this reminds me a bit of Chris Freeman and Mont Ventoux last year you know in the yellow jersey going quite quite far from the top um, you know, still a feral feral distance to go and uh, Nibel is riding straight up to those the leading the leading pair Koenig and, and uh, Micah um, and yeah he's I think Pino has made a big sort of tactical blunder here, hasn't he? He was he was riding he was riding very hard in that group when he really didn't need to. Well, I mean, what do you do there? You know, traditionally the yellow jersey um, is is the guy who should be on the front, but you know, Nibley's in a position where he can defend yeah, Pino. Think, uh, you ride on the front, but you don't ride like that. I mean, I think we could see from the the expression on his face he was making a big effort. He he made a big effort just to catch Valverde and Nibley. 
then he went, more or less went straight to the front. And he, he was making a, you could see that he was making a big effort, um, as almost as though. Do you, oh, would you prefer him just to a kind of Gallic shrug, Rich? Yeah, and just yeah. A, but it's, it's almost as though he was riding uh, to distance the guys behind him rather than. Which he probably what, which he surely was. No, I mean, I think he is is very aware that he's not thinking of winning the Tour de France. He it would be a fantastic result for him if he finished in the top five. He came into this tour wanting to finish between sort of fifth and eighth place. So if he manages to finish on the podium, that is a result beyond his wildest dreams. Even yeah. better if he if even better if he'd just not made quite such an effort there and then followed Nibali when he attacked. Let's not be too harsh on him. I mean this is the first time he's really been in this sort of position where he's got some tactical cards to play. Um, the, the problem for all of those guys is the gap to Nibali before the start of today's stage was already two and a half plus minutes. So they're going to have to do something pretty fantastic. And, and really, they're relying on Nibali falling apart to a certain extent to, to close that gap. So you can, you can see that Pino is trying to cement his place on the podium while he can. And, and he's got Bardet at out the back at the moment Bardet is chasing having to do a lot of that work and obviously he's probably um, doing that work for his teammate Perot but Pino is is moving into a strong position here if he can maintain it to the top yeah yeah, I mean we were making the point today Lionel Nibali does look you know clearly the strongest rider in the race until today's stage uh, the the most of his his advantage was gained on the cobble stage you know he only had 15 seconds on uh, Thibaut Pino on the only real sort of mountaintop finish at La Planche de Belfi the other day. You know, there wasn't much tangible evidence of his superiority on the climbs really until this today. No, that's right. I mean, it was uh, he gained almost two minutes on Richie Port and more on just about all the other climbers just on the cobbles. So that's where his advantage has been forged, certainly. And just talking to a few coaches on other teams over the past few days, um, they have noticed and we have noticed as well that. Nibali does attack very hard, but then he also plateaus quite soon after that. You know, within 100, 200 metres, he tends to um, open up a gap and then the gap tends to hold. Well, let's just move in now and uh, watch the closing few kilometres. Well, we've just watched Nibali win his third stage of this tour, which is uh, quite, a, quite a tally of stage wins already. And he's taken 50 seconds there out of uh, Valverde and uh, Thibaut Pino. Valverde j- jumped Pino on, on the way up to the line, and that earned some disapproving tuts from uh, various Frenchmen around, standing around me at the Garmin Shark bus. Uh, but there's, there's something about Valverde, isn't there, that, that people uh, don't warm to. Well, you could see that happening from a long way out. I mean, I'd like to know what Pino and Valverde were saying to each other as they went up the climb. Perhaps, Daniel, you'll be able to find out if you're going to the FDJ bus shortly. Um, but that was about as predictable as you get on the Tour de France. Valverde was going to jump Pino at the end there just to put a few seconds between them. I thought Nibali was good. Um, He's clearly the best climber in the race but he didn't exactly leave uh, Leopold Koenig and Raphael Maika for dead did he? And they'd been out there for a fair while on their... It does illustrate what the point that Daniel made earlier. You know his his initial attacks look very impressive but he doesn't then he doesn't sort of take off He, he does plateau it does sort of settle into a rhythm. Not that, not that you know, not that I can see him at this moment in time being being beaten this tour. But you know, there have to be questions about about the strength of his team after today. And you know, he's been riding hard since stage two of this tour to maintain that sort of level of performance. That that, that intensity of effort for three weeks is going to be uh, tough. And surely he's going to have a hard day. Uh, you know, a, a difficult day. In the final week, Daniel, what do you Daniel, think? You, well, you thought he was riding within himself, the, the way he was climbing, perhaps he was riding a little bit within himself. Yeah, I mean, there are two schools of thought, aren't there? That there are people who say that um, you should count on a ground tour, ground Mar- tour Mar- 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 on his bike in a pair of jeans, um, stonewashed jeans. Um, the people who say you should kind of count and measure every droplet of energy and never ever spend too much if you don't have to on a ground tour. Others, and I probably subscribe to this theory that you should strike while the iron is hot you're not going to be in absolutely top form for the whole three weeks you're going to suffer some days and Nibli obviously had it within him to to take more time today and he did that and uh, you know those could be uh, 40 valuable seconds come the end of the race Shane Sutton always used to say that you start a grand tour with a full tank of petrol and it is about managing the distribution of the fuel over the course of three weeks that's a that's another school of thought i suppose it's all starting to kick off here chap should we go our separate ways and reconvene let's, let's divide and conquer okay you're listening to the telegraph cycling podcast 
supported by Jaguar. Tweet us at cycling underscore podcast. Okay, chat. So we're back down at the press centre now, having been around the, the team buses, uh, trying to speak to riders and directors. Uh, just to wrap up the stage, um, a very impressive uh, stage win for Nibali, of course. Um, looked very comfortable, but one thing you mentioned this, Daniel, how how he looked like he was riding within himself. Uh, the guy who wins often looks like that, doesn't he? Because he's the confidence that comes from having dropped everybody riding to the win is is. Yeah, it's one of the most misleading things I think that often we see guys winning races looking fresh and that can actually not be an accurate picture of how they're actually what the, the effort is actually taking out of them I think No you're right I mean everyone gives you know to use the footballing cliche everyone gives 100% 110% in fact not just 100% what I suppose I meant by that is that Nibali never had to go really deep into the red as deep into the red as you know we saw other guys trying to hold wheels and sort of in that kind of panic state that you get into when you see the guy above you on general classification disappearing up the road um, you know if Nibali had had to go harder at any point or at certain points I think he probably could have OK so a great day for Vincenzo Nibali a good day for Timo Pino a good day for Alessandro Valverde a terrible day for Richie Port and Team Sky uh, and I camped outside the Team Sky bus at the finish and I spoke uh, briefly to Dave Brails for the team principal and uh, Richie Port, who initially wasn't going to stop and speak, but he did stop briefly. Obviously, it wasn't the Richie that we've seen for the first part of the race. And, um, you know, he's just got to rest and recover and try and go again tomorrow. Do you see that coming, Dave, or with the same square that the team was in? No, not really. To be honest, I think, you know, the first climbs and the, the efforts that have been made uphill have been, have been good. To be honest, so apart from we, we knew it was going to get hot. I think that was we were a bit concerned about that, obviously. And from the rest day, we knew that it was going to get hot. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, that's the same for everybody. Um, so yeah. I'm just is it, is the heat something that Richie suffers? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I think no, not particularly. I think it's a transition from cold to hot that can catch you out, you know. And, and, and that's what we've been a bit worried about, to be fair. And I think Geraint felt it as well today. But equally. Listen, it's no excuse, you know, it's not trying to, trying to hide anything, it's not a great day and you've got to hold your head up and what get on with it, you know. What will be Team Sky's ambitions in the tour now then? Well, we're not just going to roll over, I think, um, obviously it was, a, it was a blow losing Chris, you know, when you think you're coming here to try and win the race, and certainly having seen how nibble is going, it'll be an interesting race, so that's for sure. Um, and then recalibrated to, you know, to, to our plan B, as it were, um, and now I've got to recalibrate again, but I think, you you know, you just got to take stock of the situation, not get too downbeat there's still a lot of racing to go and, and, and try and get something out of the race, that's for sure It's one of those things, I think um, you know, it's a massive shame but uh, you know, we'll just see what happens tomorrow yeah, it's not the best either but uh, you know um, it's a shame, I think I feel you know, more for my teammates who have been brilliant uh, for me every day but you know, if it happens to me, I think it can happen to the other guys too, so um, you know keep on uh, pushing so Richie Port uh, really collapsed today his overall ambitions I think are, are over um, and it's as Dave Brailsford said a case of recalibrating for Team Sky They're, that was plan B either down to plan C or plan D now I guess um, plan G Garen Thomas I, I know we're not supposed to use writers nicknames but um, he, he Dave Brailsford spoke the other day actually about being slightly concerned about just how much Garen Thomas was doing in this tour and it perhaps caught up with him today because he, he didn't I'm not sure we'd have expected him to stay in that front group but he was dropped fairly early on I think on the climb and you know perhaps all those efforts that he's been making over the first sort of 10, 12, 11, 12 days of this tour caught up with him Yeah well a lot of those left efforts have been as a result of falling on the floor having to get back up and chase back on and as we've said repeatedly over the, the podcast that takes its toll and um you know, it, 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 I suppose it's a case of what might have been for both Port and Thomas because they have this completely free hand to um, to show what they can do in a in a three week Grand Tour in, in and in the the, the biggest and uh, baddest of them all, the Tour de France. And we now won't really get an indication of um, whether they have that that kind of deep level of consistency that you need. But perhaps we are. Perhaps that's what we are well, getting with yeah. with Richie Port in particular. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I hate to say I told you so, but with Richie Port, we've been talking about the 
Um, his tendency to have a bad day since the top, start of the tour. Put that to Dave Brailsford in Mulhouse. He, he was quite almost defensive about it. He said that um, last year at the States, the Banyer de Bigor, where Port collapsed, um, there was a, a unique set of circumstances in the first hour of the race which made him go deep into the red, and, and that was why that had happened. But, you know, the general classification in major tours and, and someone's um, sort of CV in major tours doesn't lie in Richie Port's always had a bad day um and and Geraint Thomas as well you know people say they see him at the front of races and they see him at the front on climbs and they watch Paris Nice and they say oh this guy's got the potential to be a, a major tour contender but there is a, you know he's light years away from that at the moment I'm sorry I mean um there is a million miles between being good in Paris Nice and contending for the Tour de France well, on that subject, Daniel, I think you had a chat with your doppelganger, uh, Max Chandry. Uh, oh, very right strange. Like, very strange as I walked past the two of you, and it, it was like you were standing looking in a full-length mirror. Yeah, there's the hair. I'm the kind of wannabe Anglo-Italian. He's the real Anglo-Italian. There's the, you know, the impressions. But, yeah, um, I did. Um, started off with Max talking about TJ Van Garderen's performance. We both sort of agreed that it was a good, not great day for Van Garderen. Then we went on to talk about Richie Port, and you'll hear here that... Um, Max really here, wanted here. Here, here. You will hear that Max really wanted to say more than he actually could about Richie Port. Um, he obviously has quite strong feelings about Richie Port and um, how prone he is to bad days. But he managed to stay fairly discreet. Um, so here he is talking about Van Garderen first, and then Richie Port. Contact in quiet, but we're really happy about it. You know, I think. Uh, uh, TJ did good, you know, he kind of had, went through a little bit of a moment being right behind him, uh, we haven't spoken to him yet, he kind of hesitated a little bit. Uh, then he got a good rhythm on the climb, he started open gaps and started making time back, you know, we got a good team around him at the end of the day, I mean, everybody was there and bottom of the climb, you know, Stenner stepped in really well today, uh, and Avon did a good job, so it's just staying quiet, tucked in, Go through tomorrow, rest day, and we got the last week and uh, time trial. That's what we're looking at. I mean, it kind of looks like between sort of fourth and seventh is my position at the moment. Do you feel that, or do you think he's, he's maybe better than that? Well, you know, we always hope for the best. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to be too uh, bouncing around, so if we just kind of keep a bit of a quiet mm. happiness, uh, yeah. we for sure look for pretty high up mm. because we are confident that TJ is on a, he's on a good moment mm. you know he came if you just have to look back a little bit you know he, he, he came out of golfing on the good side but he still needed some, some kilometers to be where he is up right now yeah. I think we just with a good moment is, uh, what did, did the port loss of that much time that surprise you well you know I don't want to say I mean I, uh, Richie's a great guy and, and you know as a could be a lot of talking. I could I could talk a lot about this, but um, <laughs> yeah. we all know that Richie has one off day. You know, I think a lot of people know that, and uh, I think today was his bad day. He put himself back into try and win stage. Maybe I don't think GC has gone for him big time. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I have to stop him. Nice. Yeah. Without being specific about Richie, just generally when guys have have a tendency to have those really bad days is it more mental than physical do you think is it some guys can really dig in and, and limit it to three or four minutes whereas yeah. other guys just kind of well know, I think it, it's just, it could be a mental thing as well because I mean Cadell was one of them guys and he yeah. ended up winning the tour you know so and Cadell always had a bad day you know yeah. he always run uh, I think it is a mental thing I think uh, you know I don't know how you can cope with that but you know, some guys got around it and just made a, you know, again, Cadell, can't think of any other guys really with bad days, but then can kind of win a big grand tour. But we knew kind of Richie, had, he's going through that, and he wasn't a leader in this team, he was a sport leader, he's a great rider. But, you know, there you go. Podcast daily during the Tour de France. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, supported by Jaguar. So it was Max Chandry, or Daniel Freib as Max Chandry, not really sure. Um, we're going to get more of Daniel as Max Chandry um, as this Tour de France goes on. Now, Lionel, you camped outside the uh, the uh, net app in Dura uh, we should, bus. We should, we should point out that he didn't literally camp. You know, you you are booked into hotels every night. There's no tent in the mm. back. 
no, of the that's a of fair point. <laughs> that's a fair point, Daniel. I'm glad you pulled me up for that. Um, he uh, metaphorically camped outside the Net Appenjura, not even a bus, a camper van. Mm. A camper van. It's like, it was like an awning that you had there beside it's the kind of uh, visceral camping. Vicarious camping. Vicarious camping. Uh, Lionel, so you were waiting for your man, who you tipped at the start of this tour as the uh, potential outsider, Leopold Koenig, uh, who rode exceptionally well today. We know he's a decent rider from the Vuelta. Um, I think the ambition, I spoke to Paul Voss, yes, he said the ambition for Koenig was top 15 overall, but he's looking pretty good for maybe top 10. Well, yeah, you say that. Um, in one of the interviews he gave t- in English um, before I got to talk to him, he actually said that it was a team that set that ambition of top 15 and he's not putting a ceiling on it or indeed uh, feeling pressure to live up to that necessarily. He doesn't want to think that um, the top 10 is out of reach, but nor does he want the pressure of um, having to live up to an overall performance. He just wanted to go out today. Um, he, he said he was glad that he was with Micah, um, Raphael Micah of Tinkoff Saxo, because he's a strong climber. But he was, um, he was fairly guarded in what he said um, about Micah's efforts. He felt he could have done a bit more, um, certainly in the middle part of the climb, um, and that, that Koenig felt he was, he was doing the bulk of the work. But um, there was a real nice atmosphere outside the Net at Endura bus because um, Koenig's mum was there, some other members of his family. They were all wearing Net at Endura jerseys, um, huge Czech flags. Um, and, and I think, you know, he's, he's going to be one of those riders that we'll look back on at the end of this tour and think that this was his breakthrough um, performance. I mean, the, finishing in the top ten of the Welter is, is uh, fantastic, but the Tour de France is, a, is another level altogether, although you know you could argue that um, the level of competition he's up against is, n- is going to be almost Welter-esque, apart from Nibali. But I um, grabbed a, f- a few words from him um, as he warmed down on his uh, turbo trainer. I'm waiting at the NetApp bus at the finish here in Chamrus and uh, I've just heard that the first 10 riders on the stage have been asked to go to doping control. I say asked, I mean forced to go to doping control, it's not optional. Um, and Leopold Koenig of the NetApp team, who is uh, one of the two riders out in front before Nibali caught them, uh, he obviously finished in the top 10, so I may be in for a little bit of a wait here. Well, here comes Leopold Koenig now. He's just coming back to the NetApp bus, so I'm going to go in and try and get a quick word with him. Leo, you have see, uh, your mum and some family and supporters here. How much uh, did that give you extra motivation on the final climb there? Yeah, it's quite nice feeling when you see all along the road all the Czech flags because you can really see the flags. I don't see the people, but the flags, you know, it's quite amazing feeling. So I realise... I had uh, a lot of support and I'm just grateful to them because it's a really nice feeling. How big is cycling in uh, the Czech Republic at the moment? It's quite big because after every stage I'm getting like free interviews for the biggest uh, magazine, newspapers and uh, TV stations so they care a lot and I think the, the tour, the race is a lot it's a lot used even in a, in a sport TV in the Czech, in the national Czech TV. So I believe it's quite popu- popular and uh, the people are enjoying. Now, when usually in the Tour de France, when the yellow jersey catches the breakaway on a final mountain, we we expect the yellow jersey to go past and take a big gap. But you and Micah, particularly you, kept that gap very small. Did did that encourage you a lot for the future mountain stages? Of course, because. I expect the same, that's why I didn't even try to follow Nibali, I just went my own pace and in the end, I don't know exactly how many seconds, but I think maximum 20 and that's, that's something which gave, which gave me extra confidence because, like you said, I expected to get a gap like one minute, but finally the gap wasn't there, so I'm really happy. Okay, well, we'll wrap this up in a moment or two. Just a reminder that you can find us on Twitter at cycling underscore podcast on Facebook and like us there, win a pair of Oakleys. Not everybody who likes us wins a pair of Oakleys, but someone who likes us will win a pair of Oakleys. Uh, we're blogging every day on thecyclingpodcast.com. Daniel has written an excellent blog today analysing Peter Sagan's various near misses. And uh, a competition uh, that... Uh, 
a listener uh, suggested um, we did a competition the other day to win a phone call from Jonathan Waters we'll have one next week to win a phone call from Dan Martin the Garmin Sharp Rider but in the meantime we're going to offer a competition to win a phone call from Chiro Scognamilio oh, really? yeah somebody somebody said they'd like to win a, a win a phone call from Chiro so we're going to organise that shouldn't be too difficult he's, well, he's up for that there's a guy who looks like him there <laughs> anyway we'll arrange that um, so again tweet uh, at cycling underscore podcast um Hashtag Chiro Call and uh, tell us, uh, in your opinion, why uh, Chiro? Why Chiro should speak to you, or why do you want to speak to Chiro? Even better, why do you want to speak to Chiro? Just uh, say Chiro is C I R O. So hashtag That's part of the Chiro part, Call. Part, part of the test. Like, oh really? Oh let, sorry. Let's, let's open that up on Facebook as well. You can, if you're not on Twitter, you can uh, leave Facebook uh, messages as well. Facebook us and suggest why. That gives you a bit more space to explain why. Chiro, speak to you. Anything else, Daniel? Can you you do, had a quick word. Can, um, can I set you guys a competition? Very mm. quick competition. Mm. I want to know the name of the mountain massif that we are overlooking here. It's a beautiful view where we are. It's a little, well, it's actually a man made lake just above the press room. Mm. And just through the trees there, there's a very. Um, is, is, it beautiful the do- is it the Dolomites? No, it's not. <laughs> is it the Chartreuse? Yes, it is, Lionel. Okay. It looks like the Dolomites to me. It's the Chartreuse massif, uh, which. <laughs> Daniel, there's a movie star bus coming down the hill towards us. Oh. Uh, hopefully, it's going to break. Um, but uh, you spoke Beautiful to the movie star at the end. Yeah, I spoke to a Xavier Unzue, who is the team manager of movie star. Um, he feels that Nibali is probably unbeatable. But I, I mentioned the stage in the Pyrenees last year to Banya de Bigol, where movie star lit it up and sort of. I well, never really got Chris Froome on the ropes, but perhaps could have done if they'd played their cards slightly differently. Um, asked Unzue whether that was something they might try again. He, he didn't rule it out, but um, he was fairly pessimistic. On the other hand, he did say that you know, with the, the weather really heating up today, um, Valverde had felt good, and um, if the weather continues in this vein, then it will be very much um, in Valverde's favour. No, you don't speak. So I think Spanish is possibly the only language you don't speak, Daniel. No, we understand French. Spanish. I understand Spanish. Are you Spanish. speaking French to him? Or? No, we, just, we, we, you know, we get by in a kind of pastiche of French and Spanish. Okay, great. Well, let's wrap up there. Lionel, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and thank you, Daniel. Thank you, both. Interviews and analysis. We've got the Tour de France covered. This is a Telegraph cycling podcast supported by Jaguar.